From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Less than five days after state and federal investigators knocked on the speaker's door inside the Rhode Island State House, it was given a fresh coat of gold lettering. A modest etching announcing a dramatic change of power, Nicholas Mattiello elected into the most powerful position in state politics as House Speaker. But the clock was already ticking, and the Cranston Democrats' time to line up his priorities for 2014 is compressed, adding even more haste to an already frenetic legislative process and major league economic problems to tackle. I do believe that our regulatory process is too burdensome. I believe that some of our taxes make us less competitive regionally than we should be. So those will be places that we start looking, but I'm, I'm not making any determinations. Mattiello quickly installed his leadership team, and with a dark cloud still looming over Smith Hill, the newly minted speaker is focusing firmly on the future. Our guests this week on Newsmakers, Rhode Island House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello and House Majority Leader John DeSimone. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, my colleague WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Speaker, leader, thank you very much for joining us on the program and congratulations to both of you in your new positions. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank it's you. great to be here again. So first, let's get uh, this out of the way. It's safe to say the people of Rhode Island are hungry for information about the federal investigation swirling around the former speaker, Gordon Fox. Do either of you have any idea what this is about? No, I, I have no idea at all. The night before, the, the raid occurred. I, I had no idea that anything was amiss or wrong. Uh, I suspect it's not legislative, but I really don't know. You are now occupying his office. Do you know what they took? I don't. I heard that they took some records and uh, maybe potentially a computer. I, I, I don't know. Have either of you, and we'll start with you, uh, Leader, uh, have either of you reached out to Gordon Fox since the raid? No. No, I haven't spoken to How come? Him. Uh, I just uh, haven't had an opportunity to do so. All right. And speaker, have you? I have. Um, maybe the Saturday or Sunday afterwards, I just I, I spoke to him. Uh, I wished him well. We didn't talk about any uh, any substantive issues. I, I just uh, wished him well. And I, I know he was not happy with the way he left the State House, um, naturally. And, you know, I told him that he's a friend and I wish him well. I don't condone any wrongdoing and justice should and will be served if there is any. But as far as the human being, I'm, I'm always supportive and, and gracious uh, to the man. Yeah, and uh, we should point out he hasn't been charged with anything um, at this point. But what you have to, everyone imagines that he was going through a very tough time. What was his mood like on the phone? Was he emotional? Was it difficult? He was, uh, he was gracious. He was, um, he was sad that he left the building the way he did. Uh, he spent 20 years in the building. Um, he, was, um, he was just um, in a melancholy mood, I, I would say, but uh, relatively supportive. He wished me, he wished me well. Uh, he certainly didn't get involved in, in my ascension to the speakership, but he wished me well as I wished him well. Okay. It, was a, it was a nice conversation. Uh, turning to your, your new job, uh, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Leader, uh, I'm hearing some optimism in the business community. We heard you say it there at the top of the show that you may look at reducing taxes, at, at what changes to Rhode Island's tax burden now that you're in office. I, I want to get a sense there's, there's a bunch of different taxes that are out there and you probably can't cut them all if, even if you wanted to. So what do you think are the ones that, are, that really need to be focused on by the General Assembly? Well, the ones that I'm focusing on right now are the corporate tax. I, I'd like to become more competitive. We're at 9% uh, we could get to 7%, that, that would be great. We have a corporate minimum tax, that's $500. Uh, I'm looking at reducing that or eliminating that. The inheritance tax, we have a cliff. Uh, if you make about, if, if you leave in a state that's up to about $930,000, you pay no tax. You, you make 931 or whatever the number is, you pay the tax on the entire 930000 So I'm looking to eliminate the cliff and, and possibly increase uh, the, that threshold a little bit so that we keep high wage earners and people that have accumulated wealth 
in Rhode Island rather than have them leave as, as soon as they retire. On the other side of that, we've seen the projections, budget deficits for the next, for, as far as you can see, there's what's going on with um, Twin River versus the Massachusetts casinos. What are the odds of actually having the resources to make those kind of changes you're talking about? Well, you, you have to commit to making the changes. So uh, we do have challenges ahead, but we're going to continue to have challenges ahead unless there's a change. We, we have to make changes in order to create a better future economically and if we create a better future economically we're not going to continue to have these structural deficits uh, for as far as the eye can see so I, I think the changes have to come before we have more economic prosperity majority leader I'm asking you this question because you are a, a lawyer for the Providence Teachers Union will binding arbitration for teachers be a priority for the house no I think that we've already said what the priority is it's uh, to change the economy to move in a positive direction as the speaker just said uh, we're in conversations to try and uh, increase and, and start an economic engine in Rhode Island and that's really our priority. So you do not anticipate binding arbitration to come up for a vote or be explored this session? Well as we speak I haven't even thought about binding arbitration. Uh, the speaker has, has set a policy and an agenda and that agenda is to move forward with uh, to stimulate the economy of Rhode Island and, and that's what we're going to concentrate on. Some might say that there could be a conflict of interest because of your professional job and topics like this. If, if that does come up for a vote, would you recuse yourself and how do you respond to those people who think it's a conflict? Well, initially let me say it's not a conflict. I mean, uh, the Providence Teachers Union is a client of mine. I'm in private practice. I have many clients. Uh, I don't work for the Teachers Union. They're a client. Uh, as, and I've had other clients in the business community as well, so uh, I don't see it as any conflict. And uh, you know, as the speaker has said, uh, we're concentrating on moving the economy of Rhode Island, and that's our top priority. Okay. Um, uh, one thing we've been hearing, Mr. Speaker, is uh, from someone, especially on the left of your caucus and your party, this idea that. Uh, Nick Mattiello, Speaker Mattiello, he's not even really a Democrat. He's a Republican in Democrat's clothing. Obviously, you run as a Democrat every time, so we take you at your word on that. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, why are you a Democrat? You know, do you consider yourself a full-on Democrat, and, and why are you a member of that party? Yes, I, I reject that notion. I, I'm a Democrat. I'm a proud Democrat. Um, I don't believe that Democrats all have to be on the furthest left outpost. Um, there are some people that believe that, but that is not the majority of Democrats in Rhode Island. I believe I represent a typical Democrat. I, I care about jobs. I care about the economy. I care about families. I care about an appropriate safety net. Um, I care about basic middle class values. Um, middle class values are in the middle, and I tend to politically be situated in, in the middle. Uh, from my ideological viewpoint, I could look a little left and I could look a little right. And that's where I think most legislators are. And that's, I think, the best place to start. I'm fact and evidence driven. I'm not, I'm not ideologically driven. Now, one of the things they have been pointing to is making uh, Representative Doreen Costa, who's of course a Republican, uh, number two on the House Judiciary Committee. Why did you do that, considering she's not a Democrat, you're the leader of the Democratic Caucus? Because I don't think any one party has all of the good ideas. And I believe that the House has to move forward in a, in a different manner, a different way. Um, there's, there's too much raucous debate between the parties. I, I think that we have to respect each other more. There's a time for politics and a time to govern. And after the election process takes place, we have to come together. And I, and I, I want more bipartisan discussions and communication so that all of us together can best serve the people of the state of Rhode Island. That's my approach. It, it doesn't mean I'm less of a Democrat. It means I want to reach out to the other side so that we can have better communication and serve the general public better. Uh, we have two very influential people at the table here, so I open this up to both of you. In light of what happened within the past couple of weeks, would you explore restoring the Ethics Commission, the power to the Ethics Commission that was taken away after the uh, Senate President William Irons case? Leader, we'll start with you. Well, I mean, certainly uh, we're going to look at all uh, ethic, you know, proposals, and, and I think that uh, we'll come up with uh, some ideas, but I, I think the emphasis has to be and has been uh, with this new speaker. Uh, speaker Mattiello has, has said that we're going to try and move Rhode Island's economy forward. Some people think this is tied directly into the economy, that the, uh, you know, the pallor of corruption over Rhode Island makes it difficult to lure businesses here to grow jobs. 
So why is ethics not tied into the economy in that light? Well, well we're, all, we're all opposed to corruption. I mean, that goes without saying. But what's important to get business to Rhode Island is to have a climate of economic uh, development and a climate that we want to do business in Rhode Island for good, honest jobs. And, and I think that's what's going to drive this economy forward. Speaker of the Ethics Commission. Well, let me first say, the, the premise of your question, I, I think, is a little flawed. There's this, this belief that there's this corruption in government. Most folks that work in government, that, certain, that work in the House, um, have no other agenda but to serve their, their public and their constituents as, as hard and as well as they can. I know of no corruption in government. So passing the ethics bill right now is, is not going to be this magic bullet that, that stimulates our economy because there's no underlying corruption that we have to get rid of. That doesn't mean that the ethics bill is not something that should be considered. But I've become speaker at a time when I have I used to say 100 days. I don't, I don't think it's 100 days. I think it's 60, 70, 80 days in which I have to make my mark on the economy and to try to stimulate the economy. We're in those discussions. I just simply may not have enough time in the day to address a very complicated issue. <clears throat> we have a speech and debate clause. When my members take the floor, I want to protect their ability to exchange ideas on the floor, say what they want, say what they mean, without fear of, of any of having to answer for what they say in any other place. That's been built in our Constitution from our forefathers. That, do, that doesn't sound very encouraging to the people who are supporting the ethics bill. No, it, it, it should not be discouraging. What it means is that I'll be very thoughtful and deliberative and protect that right. So even though it seems like a good government agenda item to say let's do ethics reform, I also have to protect the people's ability to have a house that's going to exchange ideas and work on their behalf without fear of having to answer for that somewhere else. And you said you're not aware of corruption, so you're clearly separating what just went down at the State House two weeks ago, correct? And your comment that you're not aware of any corruption. Well, I don't know what the underlying facts of that are. I, if you asked me today, I would suspect that was more personal in nature and not governmental in nature. Okay. So an ex ethics bill, whether you pass it right now or not, would not have had any impact on something like that, if I'm correct, because I'm not aware of any corruption at the State House, and I've been there for a while. I'm not aware that the facts that led to that raid had anything to do with governmental business. So. It, 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 it's a rallying cry for some type of ethics reform, but you have to have a causal relationship between the two. When uh, we have to go to a break, but I, I want to wrap up this first half with this question. When Ted put on Twitter that the two of you were going to come on this program, uh, the number one thing that popped up was to ask you guys about the master lever or straight ticket voting. Now, I realize Twitter is not a scientific poll here, <laughs> okay, but people uh, obviously care about it. Will you bring it up for a vote to abolish the master lever? We are in discussions to consider that. I know a lot of people want to get rid of it, and I certainly respect that, and, and I'm mindful of that, and, and I think it's an important thing to consider. Once again, if we can get there. That's a slightly simpler issue to deal with. There's no constitutional issues involved. Is so, there an argument to keep it from either of you? Yes, a lot of elderly folks like to use it. Now, even though they don't come in and testify, and they and they vote, but <laughs> even though then I don't expect that they're going to come in and testify and say, Speaker, please keep the master lever because I want to use it one day every two years. They're not going to do that. But do I believe they actually like using it? Yes, I believe a lot of people appreciate it and, and like using it. So there are two sides to that issue. It doesn't mean that we're not going to consider it. We are absolutely considering that issue. All right. Uh, we're going to take a break here on Newsmakers. Our guests are House Speaker Nick Mattiello and House Majority Leader John D. Simone. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week, House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello and House Majority Leader John D. Simone. Uh, uh, Leader D. Simone, you were one of the relatively few votes against the pension law in 2011, the, the big Gina Armando led uh, one. Now there is this big settlement that's out there. I know there's a lot of discussion in the General Assembly about whether it'll be taken up and there's a lot of steps to go through, but I'm just curious, what do you think of the settlement that's come forward, particularly as someone who had concerns with the original law? Well, I, 
I, uh, I have looked at it. I haven't looked at it in any detail. Uh, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there's a few steps to go uh, in that settlement before it comes to our plate. And uh, when, it, when they finish what they have to finish in terms of the voting of the individual members to try and approve that settlement, then I, I feel as though it'll be an opportune time for us to look at that. Does it look like a reasonable uh, compromise to you, though, to end, to end the litigation? Well, uh, any time both parties are, are interested in, in having a settlement, uh, you know, it's between them. But, you know, obviously the Speaker and I will uh, look and see what's in the best interest of the people of Rhode Island. That's our primary concern. And the big question then, Speaker, is do, do you expect a vote on that pension settlement during this General Assembly session? Hard to, hard to say. We, um, it, it's an interesting process, you know, I've said that in the past. Uh, it should be a legislative process where we're getting a bill that's being sent to us essentially from the judiciary. Um, talk about separation of powers issues, but uh, having, having said that, if it does get to us, unfortunately it's going to get to us right around budget time. Um, so that's concerning to me right now because I, I've, I've got to work on a budget that uh, I've made some promises for economic reform and, and we're going to try to create a budget that uh, stimulates the economy, creates jobs. Um, so that's my priority, but that uh, the, the lawsuit and the pension legislation is very important to the House, uh, to myself, to the leader, to the citizens of the state. So we will give it every consideration that we can, that it deserves. So uh, let's see when we get it and, you know, let's see what the time frame is and we'll, we'll deal with it then and I'm sure we'll have I will say, you don't sound happy about it. You sound like <laughs> right. it sounds like a burden to have to look at this and everything. Well, it's, it's not that it's a burden. It's part of our responsibility, but it's difficult when it gets handed to us at almost the same time that we're going to be concentrating on a budget. And you know my priority, jobs and the economy. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to take anything up or put divert too much time to an issue that takes away from jobs and the economy. That's my number one goal. That's the leader's number one goal. That's the House's number one goal. If, if in, during my uh, uh, acceptance speech when I was elected uh, speaker, uh, you heard the applause from the House every time I said jobs and the economy. Uh, that's where the House is. That's where the overwhelming majority of representatives are. They, they, they want to work on, on the economy. Uh, we're all tired of being in last place in, in unemployment or in first place in unemployment with the highest and we want to change things. You know, this, all this sort of strikes something here for me. Um, both of you are talking about a lot of important issues you have to tackle in a short amount of time. Um, so you need all hands on deck, right, in the chamber. Do you, e either of you anticipate to see Gordon Fox back in the chamber again this session? Well, that, that's, up to, uh, that's up to Gordon Fox. I, honestly, I, I, would be, I would be very surprised. Leader, you, you're in Providence. He's District 4 in Providence, correct? Yes. Um, if he doesn't return, is he doing a disservice to his constituents? Well, that's a decision that's, the, as the Speaker said, that's up to Gordon. That's a personal decision that he has to make. And, uh, you know, we really don't have anything to do with that decision. Yeah, uh, Speaker, is there a process if, or a requirement for attendance on lawmakers? I don't believe there is. Uh, we have to answer to our constituents. I was elected in 2006 for a session that started in 2007, and I'm pleased to say that I've never missed a session. Um, in my almost eight years there, I've never missed a session. I believe that if you ask the people to support you, you better be there to support them. That's my personal decision. I know the leader's uh, always there, and, um, and that's how we're going to lead. Uh, but I don't believe there's any constitutional requirement on any particular representative. They have to answer. We all answer to our constituents every two years. Uh, five weeks ago or so, I think, last time we had you on, uh, Speaker, when you were leader, we asked him about 38 Studios, um, and so we know where he stands, wants to study the issue. Uh, they have uh, somebody in, they've gotten somebody to do that. Where do you stand on this? Do you I, think we should pay back investors in the 38 Studios? Uh, I, I share the, the thoughts of the Speaker. Uh, there's been a, a private uh, consultant that's been hired to mm -hmm. study that issue, and they're professionals, and, and we'll weigh their findings and then we'll make you know, the appropriate decision once we have all the available uh, expert opinions on that subject. Speaker, the door is open though, it sounds like, from both of you that despite what the governor says, the treasurer says, um, and others, other state officials, that uh, the door is open to not making good on that bill. 
am committed to do what's in the best interest of the people of the state of Rhode Island. I'm, I'm going to make a fact, evidence-based decision. I've said that over and over again. Let me see what the, uh, the uh, professional's report is, the analyst's report. When does that come back? Uh, I think we should have it in several weeks. I want to see the I want to see the conclusion of the report. I want to see the analysis uh, wherein uh, the expert uh, finds his way to reaching his conclusion. I'm going to reach out. I already have to local economists, local accountants. I'm going to get a diverse viewpoint uh, on what the right thing to do is. Once I believe I know what the right thing to do is, then I will do what, whatever I think is in the best interest of the of the citizens of Rhode Island. Speaker, sticking on 38 Studios, uh, your leadership team includes some of the most vocal uh, <clears throat> critics of how the deal went down and paying the bond. Uh, Charlene Lima, of course, your fellow Cranston Democrat. Karen Macbeth now is the House new House Oversight Chair. Um, Rep. Macbeth has said very clearly she wants to subpoena people. She wants to bring them in. You, of course, are part of that approval process if subpoenas go out. I know you expressed some skepticism to Catherine Gregg at the Journal about whether that's necessary yet. Um, but, but could you see a day where you were willing to sign off on subpoenas related to 38 Studios? I could see a day when I would do anything that I thought was right. <laughs> let, let, let me say... Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> no, I, I, let, let me say, what I've said is there's a hearing on April 11 uh, to unseal... A, a judicial hearing. Not a, a judicial hearing in the su Superior Court to unseal the depositions that have already been taken. Max Wistow is, is a professional interrogator. He's taken the testimony of most of the, the, the witnesses in that case. If we can get those unsealed, and we're going to be there to advocate that they be unsealed so that our oversight committee can get access to them, I think that will be a wealth of information and will create a picture as to what occurred. Um, beyond that, once we know what that picture is at that point, assuming they get unsealed, then we'll determine if we go fr further from there. Let me say that I believe, and I'm having, this, uh, I'm having this research, I don't believe any speaker in the history of the state has issued subpoenas. Uh, I believe we've created commissions to do that, but that was through a legal process. Um, we created a law to create a commission who then issued subpoenas under extraordinary circumstances. I don't think a speaker think individual. The crisis was probably the last time that happened. Correct? Yes, but that was through a commission. That was not the speaker of the house issuing subpoenas. That is an extra extraordinary remedy, and I would only consider that if I believed it was absolutely necessary. We're not an investigative body by nature. The primary function of oversight is to oversee governmental agencies and to make sure they're doing their jobs appropriately and to report back to the house. 38 Studios is an extraordinary event. People are right. Um, Representative Macbeth, Deputy Speaker Lima, they are correct in being very critical. Uh, there's much to be critical about, but the process going forward will be a thoughtful, uh, a thoughtful process, and, and I'll, I will make my decisions in a very determined manner. Leader, what do you see happening with the tolls on the Sakonda River Bridge? Well, that's another issue that uh, the speaker and I have to grapple with. Uh, there's very competing issues there, and uh, we'll do our due diligence to see what's in the best uh, interest of the people. Do you have I a personal have. feeling about it? Are you okay with tolls on the bridge? I really don't have a personal feel on it. Uh, we're going to do what's best governmentally for the people of Rhode Island and the state of Rhode Island. Did, speaker, did the East Bay lawmakers bend your ear on this when you were... Uh, trying to become speaker at that time? Uh, no, not when I was trying to become speaker. I, it, it actually wasn't an issue, but I've heard from each East Bay member uh, over and over and over <laughs> again when I was leader. They've like advocated very, strong, uh, very strongly for, for their constituents, and, and I applaud them for that. And they have convinced me long before the, the speaker's race uh, started uh, so they didn't have to really uh, lobby me in, in that regard. But they convinced me that it's probably a difficult thing to do to impose that much cost and burden on one side of the state. There is no other bridge in Rhode Island uh, other than uh, the Pell Bridge, which, which is a tourism bridge. Um, there's no commuter bridge in Rhode Island where we have a toll. So there, there's, a number one, a fairness issue, and number two, I'm concerned about imposing costs on, on one side of, of the state. So, and I'm also very concerned about our state's infrastructure. We, we need a comprehensive uh, 
we, ha we need a comprehensive solution to a difficult problem. Uh, Speaker, we're almost out of time, and I feel very strongly that the people of Rhode Island deserve to know the professional sport team affiliation of their House Speaker. Who do you support in Major League Baseball? The Boston Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> and who do you support for, uh, for the, uh, in the National Football League? Uh, the Patriots. All right. I was afraid you were going to come out and say Giants. No, I'm, 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 no, I'm a local guy. I support my local team. Leader, are you on the same same no, page? No, we're not on the same page. <laughs> well, who do, you support? who do you support? I support the Yankees oh, in baseball. Get out. The <laughs> door's wow. right over that way. Wow. And I like the Giants. Impeach. Impeach. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, are you from oh. New York, Leader? No, no. <laughs> you're just, you're just this is the worst newsmakers <laughs> we have no, ever this had. Is, this is shocking. This is, this now, is terrible. You know, did you know this before you? Yeah, I know, did I did you not. bet this Un man? Unfortunately, didn't I didn't know that. <laughs> what a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, House Speaker uh, Nicholas Mattiello and uh, Majority Leader John D. Small, thank you very much for joining us on the thank program. You. He does get 10 thank points you. for honesty. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> if you missed any of it, including that terrible end, it's online, <laughs> WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.